all of the reasons why you are worthy of praise and worthy of worship. And Lord, it's amazing that you invite us into this relationship with yourself. And we know and we thank you that it's based not on anything we can do or have done or will do or promise to do or will try to do, but based on everything that Jesus Christ did in obedience to you on the cross. When he paid for my sins, and he paid for anyone's sins who recognizes his lordship and his saviorship and what he did on the cross. We thank you and praise you for the blood. And we ask you, Father God, to, uh, to help us to see you here. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. Help us to worship you in spirit and truth. Um, Jesus was talking to the woman at the well, and she seemed to be a person who liked to talk about theological things. They were talking about where we're supposed to worship, and who's right and who's wrong. And Jesus made an astounding statement that I try to keep bringing before my heart and my mind when I'm doing this thing and preparing for it. And that is that God is looking for worshipers who will worship in spirit and in truth. And if you bring God to your heart and lay everything that you are and everything that you have and everything that you hope for down at his feet, you're worshiping. 
whether you're singing or not. Amen. Amen? Right. If you're changing it all on, on a vehicle and you've done that, you're worshiping. But the other side of that coin is if you don't do that, you can sing all day long and you're not worshiping. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's something I try to remind myself. I want to encourage you that he is worthy. We may have questions and struggles and, and things that we're worried about, but he's still worthy. And that's the beauty of being able to lay all that down at his feet and say, you are bigger than my problem. We want to just proclaim who he is. <laughs>
I'd like to thank James for coming up and, and helping out with uh, some percussion. I think God has definitely gifted the boy. And I just found this out. You probably all knew this. Did you know that he has a twin brother in Texas? Older. Older. One minute older. <laughs> exactly. And he plays the guitar. So I think we need to have him come visit. We want to continue to praise and worship and uh, lift to God all that he is due. to give you the opportunity to bless with the, your gifts and offerings, Lord. We just come before you and offer up to you a portion of that which you've gifted us with. Bless us. You bless us in so many ways, Father God, with brothers and sisters, with your word, with salvation through your son, Jesus, with your plans that you have for us that uh, you're showing us day by day. And, and uh, we trust you with that. We want to show you that we trust you with, with the things you give us, uh, the ability to earn, and we turn back to you just a portion of that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh, let's go ahead and sing that song again. We have somebody that can run around the We already did that. Oh. Well, then, consider the offering blessed, and I guess we can turn it over to Pastor David. Unless you want to sing this. Let's sing it here. Okay, let's sing it. <laughs>
Good morning, everybody. Um, my name's Rick. I'm going to be standing in for Jason while he's um, deployed, and, and so um, I just ask that you extend your grace to me while I um, work through this for the first time. And if you if um, if you're new here today, we're thrilled that you're here, um, and uh, we'd like to um, to uh, go through the announcements in the bulletin. And if you if you don't have one if you want to raise your hand we'll be happy to get one to you so uh, would you open your bulletins with me please and so um, first item is on is on the ministry conference and um, that's been uh, is, is going to be held in, in the tri-cities you know uh, coming up in it's in April but the the um, there's a deadline on February 1st to to sign up for it, like pre-register for it, um, for the, the fee is $85 for the conference. And after that, you can still register for it, but it's $100 after that. And um, it's um, uh, gonna, you know, includes the, the, um, the concert and a lunch on Saturday, the guest speakers and worship um, and, and I guess while we're on that the subject of ministry, uh, there's a, um, we'd like to remind you, everyone, that there's a need for um, help in all of the ministries in, in the church. Um, the children's ministry, and uh, one thing, um, uh, Romel's um, ministry in, in the, the kitchen, um, the, the food ministry is, um, uh, Romel's just went to back to work praise God she she's working full-time now but she's gonna be spread thin and she would really appreciate help and, and um, I think that goes for all of the, the ministries in the church would 
um, there's there's a need definite need for a backup like right now I'm backing up Jason because he's gone and um, if, if you guys um, if God's put it on your heart to to um, to serve um, see Pastor David or, or Michael and, and I'm sure they'll find a place for you um, so anyway um, the next thing is Grace Home Veterans Center is a it's an um, outreach that is a, a, a center for um, veterans who um, uh, stay there, and we have a we we serve them a meal um, once a month. So, if you're um, interested in in uh, serving the the meal, that that happens next week, and it's um, that's at five o'clock. And uh, um, I would uh, see Romel. Or it says Jason, but Jason is not here, so. Um, uh, anyway, uh, the next thing is uh, on the bulletin is ministry, the radio ministry. We st this started a few weeks back, <coughs> um, broadcasting, I think, of, and um, it, it's it's a, on a radio station in Hayward, California, and it's uh, two o'clock on Saturday. Is it? It says weekend, but is it Saturday and Sundays? Just Saturday. Just, that's what I thought it was, just Saturday. And um, you can listen to it. There's a, a link there in the bulletin. You can, um, you can also download an app, and you can listen to the, the, the radio station on your phone or online. And, um, and um, they have a lot of good programs on it. There's a, actually, I, um, I downloaded it. It has a programming for, you know, you can choose what you want to watch on there um, it's not it's not like um, you, you like you can't like stream it um, like a like as you want it's a it's just like a regular radio station that's online um, anyway the, the next thing is the Will Graham Crusade that's in September 14th and 15th of this year but the, the um, if you're interested in um, serving um, helping out with the with the ministry there um, the the um, beginning there's there's training courses that they have in, in order to participate in that and that uh, begins the, the 24th so that's this Thursday I think 24th um, and so if you are interested in, in in getting involved in that talk to Pastor David um, and then the uh, we wanted to bring up the daily reading plan. It's 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 in the bulletin on, at the um, the end of the second page. There's the 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 outline right there for you. And I actually um, I took a picture of this and have it on my phone so I can if I don't have the the, the um, bulletin I can just refer to my phone anywhere. And um, it's not too late to to get started um, reading the. <coughs> You know, it, on this daily reading, it's very important that we all get into the Bible every day on a daily basis, and more importantly, that the Bible gets into us. That's what um, I um, I start early every day getting into the Bible, and and, um, and if I don't, if I miss it, I, I it, it kind of throws me off for the rest of the day. Um, anyway. So we'd encourage you to, and another cool thing is that this plan is, you know, if, if we're all reading it, then it's really cool that we're kind of like, we're reading it in unison with the rest of the congregation. So um, keep that in mind, but we really encourage you to, to, um, to continue in the reading plan. Um, the last item on it is the ministry partnership will be, and it's, um, it's a, it's a, a, a clothing um, ministry, and, and we're partnering with the Calvary Chapel of Great Falls in this, and it's, the bulletin says, it, um, for children, you know, um, we're collecting clothing items for children, but it's for all, for uh, men, women, and children, and of all sizes, and um, <coughs> they, they need to be in good condition, and the, um, the, the, let's see, it will be taken to Vision Beyond Borders, that's a, a ministry in Billings, right? Yeah, 
and um, the for the withholding will be distributed in Syria, Lebanon, and Iraq. And um, so, um, then uh, speak, co coming back to the ministry needs, there's we also need someone to um, be a point of contact at the church um, for that. So, as, as God's laid their, it on their heart to to um, to head up that, um, please get a hold of Pastor David. And um, I when can let's see, we can start bringing our the clothing items in any time and start collecting those. So. Um, Start going through your closets and bagging stuff up. Um, anyways, the uh, the last thing that we um, mentioned or that that's not on the bulletin um, that I didn't already mention is on uh, the next Sunday at four o'clock. Brian's going to have a um, a training session for people who are showing interest in um, being involved in the sound system. So he wants to, to get people trained up for that. You know, um, he, like, like I said before, all these ministries that we have in the church, we, we need backups on all of them. Is that you never know when somebody's gonna be out or you know, be sick or, or they're not gonna be able to do it anymore. So. It's, um, it's better to have that in place before than to try to scramble, you know, at the end and, and not have it, that need filled. So anyway, um, that's all for the, um, the announcement. I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Dave for a response and reading. Yes. Thank you. Well, let's do Psalm 119. Um, the way we're going to do it is uh, a response to you. Um, Psalm 119 is broken up into, into uh, sections by the Hebrew alphabet. And so um, what we'll do is we'll take chunks of that at a time rather than do it all at once. And so I think we'll get through the fourth or third, fourth section or something like that today. And um, why don't we all stand and give reverence to God's word as we do Psalm 119. <coughs> You'll see... Excuse me. You'll see the Hebrew alphabet in the beginning. In the beginning, and uh, we'll go through all 22 sections of it. And uh, as always, I read the odd, you read the even, and we'll end the last verse together. But Psalm 119 is pretty awesome because it has to do primarily with God's word. And I think in, in about every, I was looking at it again, every single verse you'll see some reference reference to God's word. Um, you'll hear the word the word or his judgments or the, the law or uh, ordinances or whatever it might be but it all has to do with his word and so this entire chapter is about God's word it's pretty awesome and uh, like I say about every about every verse you'll see in there a reference to his word in some form uh, with about I think an exception of about three or four verses um, depending on your Definition, I guess. But anyhow, so let's go ahead and start. I'll read the odd, like I say, you read the even. <clears throat> it says, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 1 Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed, Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart. Uh, verse 3 is an example. Uh, they also do no iniquity, they walk in his ways. You have commanded us to keep your precepts Oh, that my ways were directed to keep your statutes. That I would not be ashamed when I look into all your commandments. I will with you, uh, I will praise you with uprightness of heart when I learn your righteous judgments. I will keep your statutes of the Lord and do not how can a man cleanse his way by take by taking heed according to your word? With my whole heart I shall sign you. Oh Lord, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord, teach me your statutes. With my lips I have declared all the judgments of your mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of your testimonies. As much as in all riches. 
I will meditate on your precepts and contemplate your ways. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. O look on my eyes that I may see wondrous things from your law. I am a stranger in the earth. Do not hide your commandments from me. My soul breaks with longing for your judgments at all times. You rebuke, you rebuke the proud, the cursed, who stay from, who stray from your commandments. You remove from me your reproach and contempt, for I have kept your testimonies. Princes also sit and speak against me, but your servant meditates upon your statutes. Your testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. My soul clings to the dust. Revive me according to your word. I have declared my ways, and you have answered me, teaching your statutes. Make me understand the way of your precepts, so shall I meditate on, the, on your wonderful works. My soul melts from heaviness, strengthen me according to your word. Remove from me the way of lying, and grant me your law graciously. I have chosen the way of truth. Your judgments I have laid before me. I cling to your testimonies, O Lord. Do not put me to shame. The last verse together. I will run the course of your commandments, for you shall enlarge my heart. Lord, we just uh, thank you so much again for your word. Lord, Psalm 118 just uh, it summarizes for us uh, that we love your word. It instructs us in life. It gives us direction. It helps us even make decisions. Lord, your word, as you say, is a, is a, a living sword. And so I pray, God, that it would just pierce our hearts and let us live the way you want us to live. And I pray that you would look at us, Lord, and just uh, be pleased that you would say, well done, my faithful servant. Help us, God, to be obedient unto you through your word. Lord, we just thank you and give you all the grace and mercy, Lord. We just thank you for that. We give you all the glory, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Why don't we go ahead and hide something before we get started? Lord, we just thank you once again for your lo love and grace and mercy, Lord. Lord, as we spend this time going through the word, I pray that you would just speak to our hearts, that you would help us fall deeper in love with you. Lord, that you would just, uh, again, Lord, bring, bring conviction to work in the areas of, of our lives that need conviction. But I pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit, that we would leave here differently because of your word, because of you speaking to us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, today... Um, can you put that a little bit lower? Sorry. <clears throat> so today, hopefully, we will get through most of, uh, we'll get through all of three and hopefully most of chapter four. And in fact, we might even finish the rest of the book. At least that's the plan uh, today. And so 
just um, bear with us as we go through some things that are um, a bit redundant in some ways to um, the book of Ephesians that we went through um, some f a few Sundays ago, probably two or three months ago, we were doing the book of Ephesians. And this section in particular that we're going to pick up on has a lot to do with husbands, with wives, with uh, children, uh, with employers, being employees or servants, um, uh, and just fellowship. And so it has a lot of that uh, theme going on. And we, it seems like we just talked about it a couple weeks ago, but it's actually probably about six months ago when we were going through the book of Ephesians. But if you, again, are familiar with that passage, there's a lot of what Paul does is he picks up a lot of those themes that he talked about in those areas. And so just bear with me as we go through the text because a lot of it sounds similar um, and I'll try to change it up a little bit, but um, uh, a husband is a husband. So I can't, uh, I can't uh, make that up, you know, and so a wife is a wife. And so you'll be talking about uh, some things here that um, <clears throat> may make you feel a little bit uncomfortable. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, but uh, we'll we'll tackle those subjects as as we as we come through them. Um, I'm, not I'm not sure why it's telling me to share something here. It's scary. It's telling me to share my password with somebody. That was weird. Um, what's nice is that uh, <clears throat> you know, so that you guys all understand. What's nice about this is. No matter who's here in, in the sanctuary that you see around us, um, as we'll go through the text, it's awesome to me, it's, it, it just tickles me, uh, that there are people through technology, like we see here through Facebook, that are watching this as we speak right now on the other side of the world. And so I know for a fact that Jason is listening live and he's in Qatar, he's watching this live. Um, I know for a fact that there's a brother in India who is watching our messages. Um, I know for a fact that there's another brother in Africa who is watching our messages. And I know that somebody's getting a phone call, you know, at the same time. Um, and it's just amazing to me that, that people are doing this, that it's just, you know, mind-blowing to me. So um, uh, I don't think I'm all that, really, but I believe that God is all that. And so I love how people just just love hearing God's word because that's what they're doing is listening to God's word. And so it's exciting to me that, that, that we get to be a part of that. All right, let's uh, pick up in chapter three. We left off last week in verse 17. <clears throat> what I want to do is I want to uh, I want to speak about verse 16 and 17 again. So just bear with me as we back up a little bit and we see verse 16 and 17. It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, in hymns, in spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do, in word or deed, it says. Notice that. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. I love how Paul is, is uh, saying, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so whatever you do, whether you're helping somebody um, cross the street, or whether you're doing something at your job, or whatever it is that Paul is about to speak, speak on, and <clears throat> Paul is about to speak on, <clears throat> I know this, me clear my throat drive Brian crazy, because he's trying to figure out how in the world am I going to get that out of this radio thing. But he'll get it out. Um, but Paul says he, to do all things. And so when he says that, when we talk about what we're, the subjects that we're about to speak on, families, Paul speaks heavily about husbands and about wives and about children and about, again, workers and about you know employers and just about fellowship. He says, whatever you do, all of those things, whatever you're called to do, you do all in the name of the Lord. Whatever you're doing, whatever your calling is, I don't care, like I said before, if you're a janitor, it doesn't matter. If it's, if it's an elder in a church, it doesn't matter. 
If it's somebody who's helping in the kitchen, it doesn't matter. If what if you're a plumber, it doesn't matter. What if God has called you to do that, then you do that calling as the Lord has called you. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't mean that it's not important. Just because you're not up here speaking, or it doesn't mean that you're creating a, a you're doing a menial task. It doesn't matter. If God has called you, that is the highest calling in your life, whatever that might be. And I love how, um, I, I think I've said this before too, when we were um, first married and going to Calvary Chapel of Diamonds, uh, of West Covina at that time it was called, uh, Pastor Rawl, he would have people in ministry, they would serve pastors, their first calling would be janitorial ministry. That's, that's what it was. And his feeling was that if you can't do that with the joy of the Lord, cleaning bathrooms, scrubbing toilets, whatever it might be, if you can't do that, then you're not called. I mean, it has to be with the joy in, the, with the joy in your heart, whatever it might be, whatever it is. And so I love how Paul says that whatever you're doing, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, and whatsoever you do, in verse 17, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, he says. So whatever you're doing, whatever you're called to do, that's your ministry. It doesn't matter what it is, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, there's no ones that are more important than others uh, in terms of, you know, have a higher priority or make you a better Christian. There's nothing like that. You know, it's a different calling that God might have upon your life, but whatever it is, do so as it says in the name of the Lord, give you thanks. Okay, verse 18 is one of those verses, again, <clears throat> that some people may feel a little bit uncomfortable with, and quite frankly, um, it's, it, uh, I'll explain why. Verse 18 says this, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as it is fit unto the Lord. It says there, the, the word is wives. If you look that word up, wives in the Greek, <clears throat> it speaks to somebody who is married, or somebody who is betrothed, somebody who is about to be married. What, you know, some, it, it speaks of family. Somebody, it speaks of marriage. And so this understanding that, that wives are to submit, I, I want to kind of clear this up, <clears throat> because... The Bible is very specific about this issue. And we kind of talked about it when we were, when we were going through Ephesians. It clearly says that wives are to submit. There's no doubt about that. It clearly uh, says that wives are to do this very thing. Now, we've kind of ruined it, if you would, because we've taken advantage of that word. Husbands, we've taken advantage of that word. Where... We've said to somebody, to my wife or to whoever, uh, what you see here in Colossians, it says in chapter 3, verse 18, we'll point it out to them and we'll even put it in fine print if we have to or large print and to highlight it. See, it says wives submit to their husbands. I don't quite do that, Julie, because she doesn't let me, but you know, you understand what I'm saying. We'll put it in their faces about that verse that God's word says you have to submit. Well, God's word also says for the husbands to submit. Back in, Eph in Ephesians chapter 5, it says very specifically, submit to one another. I think it's in verse 21. To submit one to another. Now that's Paul speaking to husbands and wives, to Christians. <coughs> so let me Nick explain this idea of submission, submitting. <coughs> Excuse me, of submitting. When you're at the supermarket, for example, let's say you go to, I was going to say Butchers, let's say you go to Albertsons, and you're at the, you're at the, you're, you're doing your shopping, and you're all done, and let's say you're 20 feet away, I don't know, 20 feet away from the, from the cash register, and you're at the same time texting on your phone, and let's just say, for example, that there's another person who is doing the same thing, and being distracted, and... <coughs> They're coming one way, and you're coming another, and simultaneously, this has happened, simultaneously you both look up and you see, oh, that person's going to their checkout, uh, to checkout stand as well. What should you do? You should typically 
be courteous and let them go ahead of you. And you probably have done that. That's the idea of submitting. You're letting the other person go first. You're letting the other, it's not that they're better than you, but it's simply being courteous. Um, another example, another crude example, if you would, let's say, for example, when you get to, a, to an intersection, I, I mean, there's a stop sign there, but let's say you get to an intersection, and what happens when two perpendicular, uh, you know, streets are coming, cars are coming together that are traveling, what should you do? You simply let them go first. You yield to them. That, that's what yielding, that's what submission means. You yield to that person. When you're driving here in Great Falls and you go to, down by that turnabout that they created, if you see a car in there, you should let them go first. If you're coming to the, to the turnabout, you should let any car that's driving in that turnabout go first. You yield to them. The Bible is full of you yielding to one another. The Bible says that you should yield to the elders of the church. Submit to the elders of the church. Um, the, the Bible, there, there's many occasions that the Bible is very descriptive about individuals submitting one to another. But it's funny to me that in marriage, you'll see people get divorces over this issue. Because they don't want to submit one to another. Wives don't want to submit to husbands. And so they'll simply call it irreconcilable differences with the lawyer and with the judge. And they'll end that divorce. They'll end that marriage through, through divorce. And so it's because we as a church, when I say church, I mean the church in general, We've allowed the world to infect us as opposed to us infecting the world, even through the issue of marriage. When you look at marriage in the last 40 or 50 years, you can see how that has evolved, this idea of marriage. It has evolved. And when you look at what God has instituted in marriage, not just in verse 18 here, but what God has instituted in marriage with regards to husband and wife, uh, with marriage, God has created that through husband and wife. Adam and Eve, men and women. But we've compromised, Christians, we've compromised and allowed the world to infect marriage to the point now where it's fair game. It's not just man and man. It's not just woman and woman. It's whatever you want to call it in some places. And so we've allowed that to happen. And when we allow, for me, when we allow that to happen as a society, I honestly believe that a marriage, it's within one to two generations of what I call a nuclear disaster in that marriage. It will deteriorate to the point where it will probably end up being dissolved. And it's sad. It's sad when you hear about the fact of Christians um, uh, who have gone through a divorce. That's sad as a believer because I don't think that's God's perfect will for your marriage. Yeah. You know, so when, when, we, when we hear about uh, couples, when we hear about individuals, who have gone through that. Um, in some regards, it's very selfish, maybe not of them, but maybe of their former spouse, or whatever it might be, because they have refused to submit, to submit not one to another, first of all, but submitting unto God, first and foremost. They refuse to do that to some degree. Now, there might be some issues through that, but it's with every issue, when you get to the heart of the matter, it becomes the matter of the heart, honestly. It becomes the matter of the heart. That is really the root problem. It's the matter of the heart. I was counseling a couple who used to come to our church about a month ago, and we were up in the office and I was talking to them, and I think I've shared this with you before, not this conversation, but the point I'm about to make. When we were talking, uh, about issues, um, I, I finally looked at both of them and I said, listen, 
you need to quit being the wife that your husband wants you to be. You need to quit being the kind of husband that your wife wants you to be. Just stop from now on. And they both literally looked like their mouths dropped, you know, and their eyes opened up. I mean, what is he saying? What kind of counsel am I getting? What I said to them is, I promise you that if you be the kind of husband or the kind of wife that God wants you to be, then your spouse will be pleased. And that's always, again, my almost go-to answer. For me, counseling doesn't take that long. It shouldn't take that long, you know, uh, because it's a matter of the heart. And so whatever the issue is, it, even if it's marriage or whatever it might be, it's a matter of the heart. And so that's what I go after first, is the matter of the heart. There might be issues that, that's going on in a, in, a, in a marriage or with a guy or with a girl or whatever it might be. But it's always focusing on a heart issue. That always is the problem. First and foremost, always. And so if that issue is addressed, I I'm convinced that when that issue is addressed, God has a way of dealing with you like you wouldn't believe if you just submit to him. And once you submit to him and, and, and that heart begins to, to, to dissolve, if you would, in your own, of your own heart and becomes God's heart, I, I guarantee you that's wonderful as far as I'm concerned because that's when you really begin, when I begin to see a, a real work that God does in that person's life. So let's look at verse 18. It says, wives again, submit to yourself, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is in, uh, as it is fit unto the Lord. This is something that wives, um, not that I'm picking on, but wives, I think, um, some wives, fail in because of pride. It becomes a pride issue. First of all, when you're submitting as a woman, when you're submitting to your husband, it's not so much that he's right and you're wrong. Amen. I think that's an incorrect way to look at it. Mm -hmm. That's the wrong way. The right, right way to look at it is first and foremost, it's what God's word says to do, to submit. But you'll also find that the idea of submission comes from submitting to God first and foremost. And so if a wife takes the proper place and is submitting to her husband, God's word simply says that when you're, I'm paraphrasing it, paraphrase of this, but when you're submitting to your husband, you're submitting unto the Lord. And so when you do that, you're not so much honoring your husband, but you're honoring the Lord. And that is a glorious thing to do. I mean, it really, really is. Now God has established, God has established ranking, if I can dare say such a word, ranking of life. And he says, God's word says that it's him first and foremost. But then it becomes uh, husbands, and then wives, and then children. And it's not so much, it's not at all that, that uh, uh, ranking of importance at all. But it's ranking of authority. And so one of the things that we need to understand is that God does not say that husbands are better than wives. He doesn't say that. God doesn't say that he died just for men only, but he died for the whole world. God doesn't say that men's lives are more valuable than women's lives. He doesn't say that at all. Oftentimes, when women will refuse to submit to the husbands, pride gets in the way. A lot of times it's because of a pride issue. It's not really a pride issue, but it's, it's the idea that they've allowed their hearts to be infected by what the world says about submission. It's, again, the world says, well, uh, he's just trying to act like he's better than you. That's not what the Bible says at all. That's not what submission is at all. It, it really drives me crazy when I hear that, because that's not what it says. It, it's somebody's wrong interpretation. But the idea of submitting simply is to yield. 
to yield to that authority. I will say this, it's not easy to submit. You know, of course, talking to wives. It's not easy to submit, especially, especially. In fact, it's easy to submit if you're right. Speaking to wives, right? Where it's difficult to submit is when it's contrary to what you believe. In other words, if the husband is making a decision, let's say it's a wrong decision, as an example. And you have, in your mind, a right, the right decision. And he is, by God's word, the final authority, if you would, in making that final decision as a family. And it's contrary to what you think. Well, that's hard to do, to be honest with you. That's hard to do, even for a male. For a man. It's hard to submit when it's contrary to what you believe. But that is where obedience comes into play. Because for a woman, for a wife, you have the liberty, if you would, to be in that position, be right, he be wrong, and almost to the sense of you can wash your hands clean of it because you're being obedient. Now, I will say this, that husbands, even though you might have that final authority, even though you might be in that position, you have to realize that you are accountable for that decision as a husband. You're accountable. And so I say this, you better get it right. You know, because if you're wrong, consequences could come out of that response, come out of that response of you making a bad decision for your family. And that happens. It happens at times that the husband is wrong to what they think is right in the decision that they've made, and now there's consequences that the whole family is going to suffer because of his decisions. And so, husbands, you got to make sure that you get that right. But when we talk about this issue of authority, husbands and wives, and wives, you need to submit. Uh, what I don't want you to think is that Authority means less value. That's not what it says at all. Doesn't mean yet you're less valuable. Um, authority, if you look at the Word of God, it simply talks about authority, but it's clearly talking also about distinctions. Everybody has a role to play. Husbands have a role to play. Wives have a role to play. Children have a role to play. Uh, you know, families have a role to play. Church has a role, role to play. But just because we're talking about distinction, everybody has a distinctive part that they're supposed to play, we need to make sure that we also include the right authority with that because that is important. And oftentimes, the world says we don't need to have that kind of authority. Well, God says we do. God says we need to have the right kind of authority in a family. We need to have the right kind of authority in a church. We need to have the right kind of authority in society. We simply need to have that because if you don't have that, chaos is developed. And when you see chaos, it just gets, it gets funky. It gets weird when you have that kind of chaos because people run rampant. You see society today, they're running rampant because the right or the wrong authority or they're not having authority in place the way they're supposed to. And so when you, up, when you don't have authority, chaos is developed, if you would. Verse 18, again, he says, as it is fit unto the Lord. And so that's really the difference between Ephesians and the book of Colossians is simply Paul says here, those, where, those very words, he says it in a general sense in the book of Ephesians, but here he says specifically, as it is fit unto the Lord. And so I want you to understand, women, wives, that submission is as it is fit. He's approved that. He says you need to have that. It, again, doesn't mean anything about value, and it doesn't mean anything about being better. He simply says there is a, uh, a, 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 
There is an idea of authority here. God is instituted, and it happens to be that men are in authority over women. Now, I'll also say this. That when we're in authority, as we're supposed to be, it doesn't mean that submission from the woman is the following. It does not mean that she is a doormat to your needs. It doesn't mean that she, she uh, satisfies your needs behind closed doors because she has to be in authority to you. That's, that's taking advantage of her. Um, that is not what God's word says at all. It doesn't talk about that. She, again, is valuable, just as you are valuable. In fact, uh, I think it's in Peter, it says that we're considered joint heirs, it says. We're joint heirs of equal value. We're joint heirs in Christ, man and woman. So, again, this idea of, of uh, less superior or being less valuable or more valuable, uh, that's not what God's Word says. That's what the world says. But that's not what God's Word says. And so um, I'd rather, of course, listen to what God's Word says about this issue. If you look at verse 19, it says, Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Uh, this is for the husbands. In... in uh, I, I was thinking about how dense we are as men at times. And again, I'm reminded of that joke of uh, the couple who's celebrating their 45 years of marriage. And um, uh, bear with me here. But this is how dense we are, and guys. And I'm not making fun of us. I'm saying the fact. We're kind of dense at times. And uh, this is a joke, of course. But um, this couple is celebrating 45 years of marriage. Great marriage. Glorious marriage, if you would. And uh, <clears throat> imagine that there's this uh, wedding fairy that's uh, also invited to the wedding. And she sees this couple. And they're both 65 years old, both husband and wife. Both 65 years old. Been married for 45 years. So they got married when they were about 20 years old. <coughs> to do the math. And uh, <clears throat> didn't get a chance to do a lot of things. But the fairy says to the woman, um, okay, I'm going to give you one wish. Tell me what you want. And she thinks for a second and thinks, man, I've always wanted to travel and go throughout the world. And the fairy says, boom, got it. So she has tickets, rolled tickets to go all over the world. And she thinks, wow, it's amazing. And the fairy tale looks at the husband and says, okay, your turn. What do you want? And he says, man, if I just had a wife that was 30 years younger than me. And the fairy tale says, the fairy says, okay, that's easy. Boom, 95 years old. <laughs> That's how dense we are. First of all, we have to do the math to get the joke. Second of all, you know, he's asking for somebody to just this goofy, you know. But husbands, it says, love your wives. We, as husbands, you never find where God tells women, wives, women, wives, love your husbands. You don't find that in Scripture. You don't find that commandment. This is not a suggestion to men. This is not Paul's recommendation. This is what God's Word says. To love your wives. Now, <clears throat> when, when, when Paul makes these words, that when he, when he says, in fact, he says, love your wives, the Greek, word, the Greek word that's used there is agapeo. We get the Greek word agape from that. But it's that spiritual love, that supernatural love. It's actually kind of a tough love, to be honest with you. Tough in the sense where we don't quite get it. We get phileo love. We get eros love. We understand that. But this idea of agape love, it's kind of difficult for us to do sometimes. And so we as husbands, we need to ask God, honestly, for help. He tells us, he gives us some of that help by him telling us, because we're so dense, he has to tell us to love our wives. Again, women don't have to be told to love their husbands. It comes natural to them. But for guys, we have to be told that. But he says again to love our wives. 
not always easy to, easy to do. First and foremost, it's not always easy because um, it doesn't come natural for us. And so when we as individuals, as men, struggle with that issue, I think we need to call upon the Holy Spirit, honestly, to ask us, give us guidance, show us how to do that, how to love our wives, how to, to uh, love them in the most meaningful way that they appreciate. Um, Julie and I are, are in the middle of taking this class uh, through, the, through, our, through the church here, this marriage ministry. Um, it's called uh, Love and Regret, or I think it's what it's called, Love and Regret. Oh, not regret. Love and respect. <laughs> that's funny. I don't care what you say. That's funny. <laughs> love and respect. <laughs> love and respect. Um, <laughs> that's hilarious. That was, that was a true mistake. Um, and in that, in that class, it really does, you know, it's off of the book of Ephesians, <clears throat> but it does talk about how men and women are different. Men are unique in that we function differently than women do. Women are different in the, in the sense of they require the whole idea that they are to be loved. For guys, we appreciate love in different ways. In a matter of fact, um, in, in Ephesians, it's very clear because it says to respect your husbands. And in a lot of ways, <clears throat> for men, that is what that is what triggers us. That is what motivates us, is this idea of respect. When we as men have a wife that is not respectful to us, it, it kind of um, it kind of deteriorates in our marriage. Our feelings that we have, uh, the things that we say, uh, how we respond to certain things. Because, quite frankly, we feel like we're disrespected. We're not respected. And so men are made up that way where we, we're required to have that kind of respect. Now, women are different. Women uh, are not that way. They see things differently. In fact, in this class that we're in, uh, if you can imagine glasses or sunglasses, uh, many times guys wear blue sunglasses and women see things out of pink sunglasses. Now, of course, bear with me on the colors, but it's the idea where they see things differently. You can be saying the same exact, how many times have you said the same exact thing to your spouse, but yet it's interpreted differently? That's not how I meant it. You know, we do this all the time, Julie and I, where, where she sees things through pink glasses and I see things through blue glasses. We see things differently, the same thing, but we're understanding it differently because we're made up differently. And so, again, we require to be respected. They are to be loved. Love and respect. And Paul says that very clearly, to love our wives. Paul says it very clearly, to respect your husbands, to honor them, submit them to them. Uh, it, 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 that's that's an ingredient, if you would, for a successful marriage, a godly marriage, that they have love and respect for each other. I don't believe, <clears throat> honestly, I'm not, I'm not uh, saying this up against anybody. I believe me, I understand that there's issues. But for me, for our family, for, for Julie and I, uh, divorce is not allowed. It's not even in our, our vocabulary, if you would. Because, again, I believe that it's a heart issue. Anything that, that becomes an issue, it's all, it always goes back there, back to that. It's a heart issue. And that has to get resolved. Has to get resolved. And it's a, it's a matter of, I mean, our family is at stake. We have four wonderful children. We have 12 beautiful grandchildren. And can you imagine, uh, as some of you might, when you have a divorce, it impacts the entire family. It, it affects them. And so for us to even think about that, you know, it, it's just, a, it, again, um, I, I look at a divorce as being a, a nuclear disaster uh, on a marriage. And, and there's always, I believe, always 
of ways that God will improvise in a marriage to make things work, always. I don't care if, if in a marriage there's been issues uh, in a, in the, between the husband and the wife uh, where um, they've been irresponsible towards each other sexually. God forgives if they repent. God forgives and he restores. He restores a marriage. He can if, there, if, 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 if these individuals would come back to God and would make things right with themselves, each other, and with God. God can restore. What, uh, what was previously eaten with locusts, that uh, God can restore that marriage. And he'll make things right. He says again to love your wives. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Quite frankly, that's real convicting. The idea of being not bitter against them, it's you, me, as husbands, being angry with our wives. That's why I say it's kind of convicting. Because I can be the kind of person where, in my flesh, I can be the kind of person, an individual, if things are not right, I can get angry about it. And I can begin to shut down. And I can begin to, whatever it might be in the flesh, that's what it is, it's the flesh. Nowhere does the Bible ever say that you shouldn't talk about those kind of issues, resolve those, those issues, whatever they are in a marriage. The Bible doesn't say, uh, be quiet, husbands. It doesn't say that at all. You know, so we have a responsibility as leaders and as husbands, I believe, to talk about those issues so that we're not angry with our wives, so that we're not bitter towards them. Hold a grudge towards them. We have that responsibility as men and as husbands. Okay, then he goes on to children. He says, children, or obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. You know, uh, I, I was reading a, a statistic, and it said that 25% of children are fatherless. Single-parent families. 25% of them have no father figure in their life. So it's tough for them to be obedient to their parents. They can be obedient to their parent, to one of them, but they can't be obedient to both of them if they're both not in the home. Now, there's ways around that. You can be obedient to them if the marriage is dissolved and they live in separate homes. You can, you can actually do that. But I mean, for the most part, children, <coughs> You know, don't have 25% of the children don't have a father figure. Now that's kind of devastating from my perspective, if you would, because that impacts several things. In fact, I have a list here of things that uh, that it impacts. I thought I had it here. Oh yeah, I did. I, it says uh, that those children that don't have a father in their homes. It says that they're four times greater to risk or, or to experience the risk of poverty in their life. In other words, those families are going to be, of, the, of that percentage, 25% of them, or four times, I'm sorry, four times greater, they're at risk for experiencing the issue of poverty in their lives. Um, it also says that there's seven times those children are without a figure, father figure, that those children are seven times um, likely to experience pregnancy. That these are the young girls. These are teenagers. That's seven times greater. They're at risk to experience the issue of pregnancy in their life. Um, they're more likely to have behavioral problems, more likely to abuse, uh, abuse drugs and alcohol. Uh, they're, they're likely to go to prison. They're likely to commit a crime. Uh, they're two times likely more to drop out of school. These kids are. It's a, this, this article, it's, it's entitled, Crisis in America. And it's true. And I, I loved, yeah, I, I loved watching the video when we were having a bunch of protests in our country, I don't know, about a year ago or, or plus, of uh, uh, people that were protesting against the police officers. And they were marching all over the place, I think in Chicago and other places. And on video, there's this woman, she's running, she sees her son protesting. 
And she goes and she goes and gets that boy and starts spanking him and beating him because he's out there protesting. And she's like, boy, don't you know any better? And she goes and grabs him. I'm, I'm thinking to myself, where's the husband? Where's the dad? He's not there. She's doing the right thing by grabbing him because that's being totally irresponsible. Amen. He's protesting. He doesn't even know what he's protesting about. And so she goes and she's on video, somebody else is videotaping this again and, and sets him straight. And I think she's faking him or something like that, or I forget what she does to him. But she is the one. It's because, again, 25% of these families don't have fathers in their home. And that's what they'll do. And so we have a responsibility, husbands and wives, not only to submit to one another, not only to love one another, but also to be the right parents, it says. Be, be, to be the right parents to your children. Children have a responsibility to be obedient. And I'm not saying that that's easy to do because it's not. Not easy to do. But God's word says that they're to be obedient in all things, it says. It doesn't say some things. It doesn't say when, when mom and dad are right only, that's when you're to be obedient. Because quite frankly, sometimes we can get it wrong as parents. But their responsibility is to be obedient to parents, no matter what. Now, I say no matter what, and I say that with a caveat, and that is this. If parents are doing something that is ungodly, right. if they're doing something that is ungodly, then I think those children are not obligated to be, to follow in their footsteps and to be ungodly with them. They're not. Now, there might be some repercussions, there might be some issues, that has to get resolved as well. <clears throat> but God's word says that they're to remain godly and obedient to him, first and foremost, to God, then to parents. So we have to be careful that we as parents are making the right decisions because our kids are gonna follow those footsteps. It's like going to the beach and walking on the sand with your youngster and them following your footsteps. They do that in life too. They're following your footsteps. They can, and so we have to be obedient to that. Then it says, uh, verse 21, Fathers, <clears throat> provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. And so this is a great responsibility that we have as fathers, that we're not to provoke our children to wrath. We're not to make them get angry because here in Colossians it says that they can become discouraged. Now, I think that as Christian parents, that really hits home because we have this idea that our kids have to fit a certain uh, you know, identity in their life. Listen, let kids grow up. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to falter. But that's the idea of you being a parent, is you instruct them. First and foremost, your commitment is to instruct them God's ways. But you need to raise them so that they're not frustrated in life, and you need to raise them in the right way that they can become responsible citizens in life. That is your obligation, is to make certain that you're raising children, your children, to become responsible citizens. And so many times when you have kids that are not responsible, that they become irresponsible citizens, we end up with the society that we have today. And that's because parents, a lot of them, have kind of let, let, let loose. God's word says, for example, God's word says, if you spare the rod, you'll spoil the child. That's what God's word says. That's not what I say. That's what God's word says. In our house, I think I've shared this before with you, but in our household, when we were raising our kids, when they were young, uh, there were a couple of rules that they had. And that was, um, they had to obey mom, respect her for who she was. They couldn't lie. It was the other thing. And if that happened, they knew what the rules were. You would get spanked. And so there was one instance where uh, our son, um, he had done something, I forget what he had done ex exactly, but he had disrespected Julie in some way and lied about the whole issue. And 
we were living here in Great Falls at the time. And he got spanked. And um, uh, so when he got spanked, uh, that issue was resolved. And we, he got a spanking. He knew what the rules were. Uh, he Again, he got spanked. And, uh, and it was over with. I mean, we talked about it and it was, we were done. Well, uh, somebody had heard that we had, that I had spanked him. Uh, our neighbor did. They heard me spanking him. And uh, after this issue was resolved, I think it was on a fr it was on a Friday on a Friday. And so Fridays for us was a fam was family day. And uh, that started off with us going to the local gas station. We went to Sinclair's and we got ice cream. Is what we would do. So we, as a family, we went to Sinclair's and got ice cream. We come back. And when we came back, I remember seeing on our door. Department of, of Human Services. Somebody had called on me. And I thought, that's kind of odd. You know, and somebody was telling me, well, you don't have to let them in your house. I, I don't got nothing to hide. Honestly, I have nothing to hide. These are the rules of our house. And so the rule is if you lie or if you disrespect my mom, and this is what's going to happen to you. And so when I had explained that to the people, the, the people that had come to the house the following Monday, uh, they understood and they talked to both of us. And uh, I, I said, yeah, I told them I don't have to allow you into our home, but you're welcome to come in our home. And I mean, it was kind of a, you know, I looked at it as kind of a witnessing opportunity as well. Um, but if God's word says that you're to do this, again, what we've done in the last 20 or 30 years is we've said, well, we don't want to offend the child and we, we don't want to hurt them. I, I think there's more danger by not disciplining the child because you begin to develop irresponsible children because they're not recognizing that with their actions, there's not going to be any, any, any circumstances. So they just run rampant. That's what we've done. We've allowed our children to run rampant with the bad decisions that they've made rather than them facing consequences to their actions. Again, God's word says, children, obey your parents in all things for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. I think, again, that when we look at children, we need to understand that they are obligated, as it says in the Bible, that they are to be obedient to the parents in all things. And as long as they live at home, it's your house, your rules, and hopefully your, those children, your children, are being obedient to your rules of that household. And if they're not, then you have a little bit of a struggle. And you have to deal with that issue. But uh, you have that until, until they're about 18 years old, uh, yeah. uh, where you can let them loose. Um, okay, verse uh, 22 says this. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but with singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to, as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that the Lord, uh, that knowing of the Lord, you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 25 says, But he that does wrong shall receive for the wrong which he has done, and there is no respect of persons. Okay, Paul says here, he's talking about servants. Some of your verses might say bond servants. But if we look at uh, this text, we can um, uh, make it fit for us today because when he says servants, it's somebody who is working that you're responsible to. That's a regular employee. That's what it is today. It's an employee. And an employee, he says, Paul says, you're not to be uh, 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 one who... Uh, it, not with eye service as man pleasers, Paul says. So let, let me explain what this person is with a eye service or a man pleaser. It's somebody, a worker, uh, I'm not picking on anybody, hopefully nobody here uh, or listening online, <clears throat> but it's the kind of individual or the kind of worker, if you would, who looks out for the boss and makes certain that when their boss is present, that they're working hard. And that's the idea of the definition of this word. Um, when they're making certain that they are working hard only, and I'll emphasize the word only, only when their boss is around. 
And those kind of employees uh, drive me nuts. They really do. Because they want to make certain, and, and uh, it, it's, it's actually a pride issue as well. It, it's, again, back to the heart. It's a heart issue. But Paul says, don't be the kind of employee. Don't be the kind of employee who one is, is one with, uh, uh, as an eye pleaser, or even, he says, as men pleasers. Now, I look at it as a man pleaser, as somebody who wants and feels that it's more important to please man than it is to please God in the work that you're doing. Listen, I believe, honestly, I believe that as a Christian, as you being a Christian worker, you should be one of the hardest employees, hardest workers, wherever you're working at, in your, in your work, in your job, or those other people there. If you're a Christian, you should be the hardest worker there. Because you as a worker, as Paul describes here, you are making sure that you're doing this job, first and foremost, unto the Lord. You're not so much looking at your paycheck as your, as your reward, but you're looking at your job and it's part of your eternal reward because you're being obedient to God, first and foremost. And if you're being obedient to God as an employee, I guarantee you that your, your boss is gonna, be, is gonna look good. Because why? Because you're doing your job. I, I, I told this to my boss one time. I'm not the kind of employee that wants to make you look good. If I do my job as I'm called to do, I promise you that you'll just look good. That's just how life is. Because I'm doing my job. He has a good employee. So make sure that when we do our jobs, we're not ones who are A, men pleasers, or B, only, only uh, work hard when our boss is around. That's not what it says. That's, what, that's not what it's about as a Christian. Now, I think the interpreters who's written our Bibles have got it wrong in some instances. And this is a classic example. They've broken up chapter 3 from chapter 4 when it all goes together. If you look at chapter 4, verse 1, it's not talking about the employees anymore. It, first it was talking about the wives, then the husbands, then the children, the fathers, then the children, then the employees. Verse 1, it's starting to talk about the employers. It says masters. In fact, it says masters, give unto your servants uh, that which is just and equal, knowing that you have also a master in heaven. That's what Paul says to those who are bosses. Those, I don't like to use the word so much masters, but those who are bosses. Don't forget that you also have a boss in heaven. You have a master in heaven who is fair and equal to you, just and equal. So you as an employer should be fair and equal to your employees. Amen. Now, that's not, that, what that means is you shouldn't take advantage of those who are working for you. You shouldn't take advantage of the law that you can with your employees. You should treat them with fairness. You should treat them with equality. You should treat them uh, as human beings, the way you'd want to be treated if you were uh, in their shoes, they're working for you. Paul says, don't forget, masters, you also have a master in heaven. And he's fair to you, so you should be fair to your, to your uh, employees as well. Look at verse 2. has nothing, I don't think, to do with masters, nothing to do with husbands or wives or anything like that. But I think it's fitting. It, I, to me, it's part of chapter 3. It says this, to continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Paul's kind of wrapping it up here. As we are. He's kind of wrapping up this chapter. And he says to individuals to continue in prayer with thanksgiving. Um, I think for us as Christians, this is one of the areas that we fail in very easily, or we can fail in very easily. It's the idea of prayer. You know, um, we get together on Sundays in the mornings. Uh, as men, in fact, I get encouraged every Sunday, and this morning I was particularly encouraged by these men, but we get together and pray. And we pray together, not only about what we're doing here right now, but we pray about every heart that's here, every heart that's going to be uh, on, on, on FaceTime, every heart that's going to hear this message. 
We want them to not hear what I have to say, but we want them to hear what God has to say for their lives. And so we pray for every single, you know, we pray for, for everybody. The hearts, we pray for them. But I don't think we do enough of that personally as individuals. We, um, you know, maybe it's conviction in my own life. Uh, maybe you're a prayer warrior and you pray all the time. Praise the Lord. That's good. That's great. I hope you're praying all the time. But it's an area where we can fail in, where we don't pray enough. But Paul says, again, to continue in prayer all the time. He says to pray and to watch in the same with thanksgiving. Uh, with all praying, also for us, Paul says specifically what he's praying for. He says that God would open us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. He says, walk in wisdom towards them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, uh, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. So Paul is saying this. Paul is saying, don't just pray, but also when you talk as Christians, when you speak, season it with salt. Not only was salt uh, a preservative used in the Old Testament, not only was salt as a preservative to help things last longer, to preserve the food, but salt, if you ever had a, uh, a bag of sunflower seeds, uh, that are salty, uh, it makes you thirsty. And so I think that salt, salt serves uh, two purposes, not only to preserve, but helps us to be a, a individuals who thirst for righteousness. And so we should be those kind of people that we season our conversation with a little bit of salt, not only by what you're saying, by what you're doing as well. And let it be an attraction let it be something that people desire in their life, that they want to be a part of. Paul also says in verse 5, to walk in wisdom. Again, an instruction that Paul says by the Holy Spirit in your life, you should walk in wisdom. Don't be a, you know, somebody who's anti-wisdom. See, see, search God's word to find out how you can walk in wisdom. Not only as fathers, but as parents. He, he, these instructions, again, they're not Paul's recommendations, but these are requirements by the Holy Spirit. And they help us to walk in wisdom. And he says in verse 7, as we wrap up here, I'll read verse 7 through verse 18. Paul is basically, he's closing this book here, and he's identifying those that are there in prison with him. Whether they're in bonds with Paul, or whether they're visiting Paul there in Rome, he lists these individuals, about 10 of them, and about nine of them are there with him, and they're there to encourage him for the work that he's doing there in the ministry. Paul says this, All thy state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother, notice, he's a beloved brother, a faithful minister, and fellow servant of the Lord. Those are the three unique characteristics about this individual, Tychicus. That he is a beloved brother, which means he is of the family of Christ. Those of you that are of the family of Christ that are sitting here, all of you here, you are a, a beloved of Christ with me. You are of the same uh, a, a belief and understanding of who Christ is. And so we say, I can say that you are a beloved brother or sister. Notice and a faithful minister. Faithful to what? Faithful to the calling that God has upon their life. Listen, we don't believe that a person is um, anointed, if you would, when they go to seminary school or when they go to Bible college. That doesn't anoint the individual. We simply recognize what God is doing in their life. God has called them to the ministry. We simply uh, ordain them because we recognize that anointing. It's obvious. So we anoint them. Paul says again, fellow minister and fellow servant in the Lord. Verse 8. Whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts. With Onesimus, which we'll pick up 
on Onesimus, by the way, next week, when we start the book of Philemon. Onesimus was uh, a, a prisoner, uh, not a prisoner, a slave of Philemon. And he is a runaway slave. And so uh, it's interesting here, we'll talk a little bit about this, how Paul calls him a fellow servant, a fellow bond servant. Uh, that's, it's funny, Paul does a little bit of play on words here because Onesimus means profitable, useful. And he says that actually in, in the book of Philemon. With Onesimus, notice his characteristics, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, probably from the area there of Colossae, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Verse 10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, he salutes you. And Mark, uh, uh, Mark's, Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, um, uh, cousin, if you would, to Barnabas, touching when you have, re sorry, touching whom you received commandments, if he come unto you, receive him. Now, um, there are some who think that there are possibly a couple of different marks here in the gospel. I think this is the same mark that Paul is talking about here. It's the same mark that we see uh, the gospel of Mark from. Uh, sometimes you'll see a reference to John Mark. It's the same individual. Um, uh, sometimes you'll see Mark used with Peter. Same individual. Uh, sometimes you'll see Mark used with Paul. Same individual. Uh, this mark is here. He says again, uh, by the way, Mark was written about the time that this book was written. Kind of interesting. Uh, we think that Mark was written around 63, 62 AD. That's probably about when this book was written here as well. Um, verse 11, he says, And Jesus, not Jesus Christ, but Jesus, which is called Justice, who are of the circumcision, these only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God which have been a comfort unto me. Epaphras, uh, sorry, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, he salutes you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all of the will of God. It reminds me of Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, where God is faithful to complete that which he has called you to do. Verse 13, for I bear him record that he has a great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea and them that are in Heropolis. Remember, I mentioned this, this triangle, if you would, Colossae and, and Heropolis and Laodicea. Those are all sitting next to each other, uh, kind of like our golden triangle here. That's kind of what that's like there. Verse 14, Luke, the beloved physician, same one who wrote the Gospel of Luke, and, uh, and Demas, they both, it says, greet you. Verse 15, salute the brethren which are in Laodicea and Nymphus, and the church was in, which is in his house. In other words, salute them as well. Verse 16 says, and when this epistle is read among you, cause that it to be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that likewise, Read the epistle from Laodicea. What book is that? It's probably the book of Ephesians. Uh, when you read that, you'll see that it's also addressed to them. And so we think it's the book of Ephesians. It's not Revelation because that hasn't been written yet, but uh, it would probably, again, the book of uh, Ephesians. Verse 17, I like verse 17, says this. And say to Archippus, notice this, say to him this. In other words, give him my words of encouragement. Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that you fulfill it. I love those words by Paul. Take heed and fulfill it. Verse twenty or verse eighteen says, uh, "The salutation by the hand of me, Paul. Remember my bonds. And grace be with you. Amen." Let me wrap up with this. Verse seventeen. Um, this, this guy that I've been following, uh, he and I have been uh, Christian, uh, been talking to each other. Um, he's in Africa, wonderful brother. And in fact, he's getting married in about a week. So if you feel led to give to him and his future bride, uh, let me know and we can, well, we can partake with that. 
uh, because uh, the funds are limited, of course, um, and uh, they want to get off to a good marriage. Uh, but they both love the Lord, Lord. But he sent me a post this week. And he simply said, he was talking about his dad. Uh, his dad was a, was a pastor. And I understood what he was saying, but I wanted to make this point to him. And what he was saying was this. <clears throat> he loves his father, and he wants to follow in his footsteps. He wants to be like his dad. His dad was faithful to the ministry. And I sent him a response, and I said, his name is Peterson. And I told Peterson, I said this, don't be like your dad. Don't follow in his footsteps. Be like Jesus. And I guarantee you, you'll be like your dad. As loving as that is, be like Jesus, and I guarantee you that you'll be like your dad. Your dad is faithful. Why? Because he loved Jesus. If you're faithful and love Jesus, it's automatic. You'll be just like your dad. And so, um, as Paul, again, as a, and I was a crazy young guy, you know, he's starting off in ministry, and I was trying to encourage him. Um, uh, and I think it was very positive, his, his response, because he accepted that. That's what he needs to be like. That's what he needs to focus on, is being like Jesus. Other stuff, you know, just come natural. He'll be like his dad. And so Paul says, those final words, is he's talking about him, be faithful to the ministry. We're told in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6, to be faithful to the calling that God has upon your life. I, I, I guarantee you that, that things in life that we struggle with, 10 times out of 10, it's a heart issue. That's what it is based on. It's a heart issue. And when we get that issue resolved, that heart issue, those other things, they become minuscule. Comparison. They become issues that can become resolved because your heart is transformed into the kind of heart that God wants you to have. Following after Him, being obedient to Him. Psalm 119, loving His Word in life. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much again for your love and grace and mercy. And today, Lord, we just thank you so much for giving us this wonderful book this book of Colossians, that we, we can look at and understand that Paul is, much like with those in, in Ephesus, he's encouraging those, not just theologically what they're to do as Christians, but how they're to live practically, as husbands and as wives, as children, as workers, as employers. But Lord, after that, he talks about how we're to live as fellow Christians. Lord, we're to love one another. That's what your word says, to love one another. And so help us, Lord, to be like that, to be Christians, to be individuals, to be brothers and sisters who love one another. Lord, help us not to be individuals that look at the color of our skin or to look at our, what party we're from, uh, uh, politically uh, speaking. But uh, Lord, I pray that more important than all those things is that we are individuals who love you. And I pray that you would help us to see that in other people's lives as well. And we can see somebody else, Lord, and we can say that that person is a fellow bond servant. That person is somebody else in our circle who loves you. I know it because of the way that they live. Lord, help us, God, to to understand that. Help us, God, to see more spiritually. Help us, God, to understand more spiritually that the enemy does not want us to succeed as husbands. The enemy doesn't want us to, to succeed as wives or even as children. Help us, God, to understand that we're at war with the enemy, not with you, but with the enemy. And it's not something that your word, your word doesn't say that it's flesh and blood. We don't go and enroll in some army to fight against the enemy in the flesh. But Lord, we know that even when we come to church here, that we face distractions. We face uh, things where we get distracted so easily, we start to daydream on the message even. But Lord, help us to understand that we need to meditate upon you and your word. That's how we need to live our lives, meditating upon you always. 
Lord, last week Paul says to sing songs and hymns. Lord, help us to be joyful in our hearts, to sing songs and hymns unto you. Songs and hymns, Lord, from our hearts that we're so joyful. Joyful for what you've done in our lives. Lord, we just thank you so much. We thank you for your love and grace and mercy, Lord, because only you have that towards us. But Lord, help us to supernaturally be able to show that to others. Supernaturally help us to have that koinonia fellowship. Help us to have that agape love. That supernatural love that only we can have because of you. Lord, help us to be merciful to others. Lord, help us to be obedient. But help us, Lord, to live lives that you've called us to live. Because you declare that we're to live those kind of lives. God, we just thank you. Again, we give you all the thanks because only you deserve it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, we went a little bit long this morning. Uh, sorry about that. Um, but next week, uh, we're going to finish up, uh, we'll start, I mean, uh, the book of Philemon. And it's one of my favorite books. They all are, actually. But it's one of my favorite books. Um, and it's a short book. It's only one chapter. Uh, but it's a story about, again, how uh, uh, a man by the name of Philemon was uh, somebody who had a slave named Onesimus. And Paul is there to set the record straight with, with, uh, with Philemon. And so he writes him this letter. And he, he, I think he does a wonderful job in setting it straight, this issue. Uh, but he wants him to be recognize him no longer as a slave so much, but as a fellow servant in Christ. And it's a wonderful book, wonderful book. It's a, it really is about fellowship. And I suppose we'll probably take two weeks to go through that book. And after we book, finish the book of Philemon, what we're going to do is go through, uh, we'll start to go through the gospel. And I think we'll start with the book of Matthew. And, and we'll have a, We'll have fun with that one. And I, I wish we could think of it. I'm anxious to do a lot of different books with you guys. But we'll start with the Gospels um, and, and, and learn uh, a, little, a little bit about that as well. So, um, as always, read ahead. You'll get more out of it. And Brian's going to finish up with us here with some more worship. God bless you guys. Let's all stand.
Joe okay? Is Joe okay? <laughs> 